experience in legal technical control. Just give us a uh, moment. Okay. Um, get back to the panel here, the guest. Marceline, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing you loud and clear. Um, Mr. We just want to make sure everybody is getting us before we restart. Mr. Bird, are you hearing us? Perfect. Okay. Love to hear go, going in and out. It is it is bad on your end. Mr. Hughes, are you hearing us? Yes, I can hear you. So we now don't like before. Um, we wouldn't like. So we basically had to restart everything. So now we are live. So in terms of true funds in, in the sense of the word, we know included. What I will do, I'll just go back to Marceline so that she can um, continue on with the I pull you guys into the discussion so that we can make a start. So Marcelin, yes, go right ahead. We are live now. Yes, Lucas. I am sorry about the, the this connection. I don't know what is going on with the internet. Normally the internet does not do that. But... Go right ahead. Yes. So uh, as I was saying, is that we, we once used to be a vibrant, vibrant little island. Mr. Hughes, when you are not speaking, sir, can you turn off your mic? Because it's your, the, the vehicles passing in the background is creating some feedback. Yeah, so we once used to be a, vibr a vibrant little island. And we once boasted, uh, you know, that we were the the food basket of the Caribbean, because as I said, we had leaders who placed emphasis on agriculture since it was the mainstay of the economy. And what are we producing now? Nothing. Only the prostitution of the CBI program, our passports, our sovereignty. And um, the farmers, uh, the, the farmers can produce anything because they have been ripped off, totally ripped off from the funds of the funds that they were given on, uh, that the government received on their behalf to rehabilitate their, uh, their farms after the natural disasters. According to the World Health Organization, we also had the best primary care healthcare in the region. Now the healthcare system has been dismantled and destroyed and our people are dying like flies for the simplest reasons. If not, if they are not medevaxed to neighboring countries that healthcare in Dominica once superseded. We ask, how did that happen? How did that happen? While 90% of, of, of our citizens became poor and mendicant on the Roosevelt's carrots leadership? Well, the answer is simple. The answer is simple. Dominicans said, give the young man a chance, give him that chance with too much latitude to roam for much too long without being checked and without being held accountable. And we are seeing the overflow as to what on accountability, not holding, not reining him in, we are seeing how it is affecting our people and it's affecting our people through economic hardship, through the evisceration of, of, of the democracy. All right, all right, Marceline, thank you. Thank you very much in terms of your opening remarks here. What, what we, how we want to, to get the, the program started off here this afternoon? We have two guests here, as we mentioned before. For those of you just tuning in now, we are live. So we want to thank our technical team for getting us up and running. Um, there is a situation brewing, as Marceline indicated, in Dominica. We're experiencing that situation in Dominica, where a lavish lifestyle by one man and his family is being perpetuated on an entire nation. So too, in Antigua and Barbuda, likewise, a situation is happening as we speak. Before I get the views of our two guests here this afternoon, let me just play for the listening audience 
and also they can weigh in on the conversation that broke some time back in Antigua and Barbuda, where one of their owners, well, um, Mr. Watts, better known as Serpent, deliberated on some contract that was signed between two parties re a house rent as we move along. And after that, I'm gonna ask Mr. Vierbert to weigh in and then Mr. Mr. Magic thereafter. Take a listen, take a listen. Everything is, 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 is locking up this afternoon, eh? Let me just make sure I get back to that clip. You know what they say about um, technical issues. When things are not supposed to happen, they normally happen, and for sure we are experiencing so. All right. Once I wait on that clip to to to, to get load up and play, Mister Mister Bird, you are you are well acquainted with that situation of the man who sits in the prime minister chair, that is Mister Dustin Brown. We'll be hearing some of Mister Super's thoughts in just a while on a lease agreement between he and another partner. Um, I don't know if you want to start there with us and, and take it from, from there, or you want to start somewhere else and, and bring us to the point that we want to get at this afternoon with that lavish lifestyle of Mr. Gaston Brown. Mr. Berger. Well, I, I would just begin generally saying the, that the lifestyle that our leaders throughout the Caribbean want to live. It's not something that you find normally in the Caribbean. That is a lifestyle where you really would find expatriates coming to the Caribbean with this sort of wealth that they live. That is something that you'd find in, for lack of a better word, more developed countries. They have that sort of wealth. But it seems to be our, our leaders are not even keeping it within reason to what we would consider uh, 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 above average lifestyle or, or, or of, of a higher standard than the average person. They are going into not only millions of dollars, they want tens of millions of dollars. I'm sure they're aiming for billions now. They don't want to be wealthy. They want to be super wealthy. They want to, to be tycoons and moguls. And that mm -hmm. is the problem here. We have some leaders who have been in politics for a very long time have been able to amass some form of wealth or some higher standard than the average person. The present crop of leaders, they want to be super wealthy. They don't want a nice house and a nice car. They want nice mansions. They want yachts. They want, I'm, I'm certain at some point in time, you're going to hear our leaders having private jets and they're going to say it like a lot of the, these, um, churches <laughs> these are wealthy churches in america where they have these gulf stream jets and when the, the somebody uh, congregation asks them why do you need a, a gulf stream jet other than flying first class on the ordinary carrier they say well it's to get out the lord's message more more efficiently <laughs> so they're going to pass they're going to pass it off and say oh we need to travel um, to get to, to get to, to to geneva to to hear a matter more efficiently and come back home they're going to have an excuse of why they're living that sort of lifestyle. In Antigua and Barbados, and I'll begin a little bit of Antigua and Barbados history just to, to link it up and let the yeah. people who are listening yeah. for the first time in know Antigua, what our situation is. Everybody in Antigua, poor people. None of us were, were, were none of the leaders. My grandfather was a, was a poor man, very poor, dirt poor. He, my grandfather was so poor. And his parents were not married, and he was a mixed race child. He wasn't allowed to go to secondary school. He had a basic education. He went to boys' school because he was a bastard. He was not allowed to get secondary education. That was the norm in Antigua and Barbuda. He was a part, he came from a part of Antigua they call Salt Street, just outside St. John's. We used to call it Garling back in the day. It was like the refuse, the, the garbage was thrown down there, right? 
situation being because of his ability, he became um, a member of the Salvation Army, although the family is really Anglican. He joined the Salvation Army, traveled to Trinidad, became the youngest captain at the time, 18 years old, and was able to build up himself. He was in the import-export business from um, the, um, his employer's men's and went into his own private um, business, selling and, 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 and purchasing goods in Antigua and Barbuda, to sell in Antigua and Barbuda. And that is how he, he was able to, to provide for his children. In 1939, they, they formed the Antigua Trade and Navy Union, and that is where he entered politics. But my grandfather was an individual that I remember. They had too much humility to be living that sort of lifestyle. They had too much humility. And I, I just want the, the Dominican people, and even those Antiguans, because so many people are so ignorant of our past. In 1971, when they had their first party election, before that, it was really on the, uh, on the, the labor, Antiguan Trades and Labor Union, the candidates come out from and compete in, for the, in the assembly. They didn't have parties before the 1971 election. That was ALP versus the PLM. And there was another gentleman, Mr. Robert Hall, who had his Democratic um, Movement Party, right? Antigua um, Democratic Movement. The Labour Party lost that election badly. And one of the guys who ran before on the union, a guy, I think is one of the Shepherd Brothers, there was two of them, two Shepherd Brothers that used to run um, to represent people. And he had to go back to taxi to make a living for his family. He was so, so not considering going into politics to make wealth that when he, the people that he went to help rejected him, he had to go back to running taxi to make a living to, for his family. And that was one of the reasons at that point in time, which I agree with the politicians said, no, we can't have somebody who has been lifted to such a heights to represent a constituency have it hard to meet ends. So they gave them free electricity and free water and these sort of perks thinking that you're going into public life not to make money, but going to serve people that your basics should be taken care of, which I fully agree with. That was 1971, so let's say about 76, 80, these are the policies they put in to give them certain perks when you get into that position. Take it forward 40 years now, and what we are seeing in Antigua is not just the perks they get in. It's not the free electricity, the free utilities or electricity, water, and the, the sort of um, telephone that you don't pay for any, any telephone um, service. Once it's in your house, they get that. But it is the salaries that our ministers are getting that is a concern because they took the perks where Mr. Shepard and so on, you can understand, was broke after he left public service. And they've taken those perks. And now even just last week, the Prime Minister in Antigua and Barbuda said several members of his cabinet came to him and said they need an increase, a raise. In a pandemic, in a situation where there has been no stimulus for small businesses in Antigua and Barbuda. I'm not talking about stimulus for everybody. I know that cannot be done, right? But I did expect there to be a stimulus for small businesses. People who own five, 10, 15, 20 employees in order for them to keep their businesses open in order so that people would still have employment. And in order for them to pay their contributions to social security, education levy and um, inland revenue overall. And that was never given. They had no money for any of that. And now you see that even these people who were claiming that they had no money <laughs> For any stimulus, I say no. After two years of a pandemic, we deserve a raise. So I just want to introduce, um, in, in begin with that, but to say what is happening right now with the sort of wealth that we are seeing. It is so, it is so displaced in our small economies that it's not. It's it's looking. It's abhorrent. It's abhorrent. You cannot define or tell us where you got that wealth from. Hmm. There's no way Mr. Brown can tell us where he got that wealth from. Mr. Brown came into politics, never running before, never voting before, never 
register himself as a voter. He had no interest in it. He was at a small bank, I think it was called Swiss American, who was a loans officer. And he claims that he was such a brilliant banker. But nobody tell me what he did so brilliant because the bank doesn't even exist today. It folded. It got amalgamated. Somebody else took it over. So he came out of that claim. He was just a brilliant um, businessman. And supposedly after 2014, he beats his chest after he becomes prime minister and says in parliament that he has $30 million. He's acquired $30 million in wealth. And everybody was just wondering, where did this money come from? In such a, this is not even a mass from... 2014, and he said that last year or this year, you know, that is in the same year that he became prime minister. And that was, that was June 2014. So already in a half which would the year. By the end of the year, the man said he had $30 million. Then the situation with that is that I was with them. I was with the Antigua Labour Party. I was born into that organization. But when you go around and you, you're talking to people and you, you campaign yourself for my own party and we're going out, we're putting um, loudspeakers in our cars. And a lot of these young men have no respect for him because they're the ones that used to be putting the loudspeakers on Mr. Brown's car before 2014. And the boy said, look, look at that man, that boy, he had $30 million in his bank account. That man couldn't even pay us one hour. Mr. Brown, you paying us $700 here today to put up your speakers and get by this and that for you to put on your car. And Mr. Brown used to be paying them in hawks and herring. Okay, I'll pay you $300 this month. Maybe I can give you two next month. That is the reality. And those young men just say, how, oh, it's, either, it's either two things. Either he didn't have the money and was broke, or he does, you can't, you have to pony elbow for get $20 from him. Because he, he was so stingy with his money, the 30 million. He didn't even have, he didn't even, wouldn't even want to spend enough money to put loudspeakers in his car to win an election. So I don't know which, which one you want. It's both, it's both just ridiculous. It sounds terrible. And these are young guys who make a living in their accessory stores and they put their speakers up in a car every five years and so on. And they're coming to say, what is this man talking about? We had it so hard to put the speaker up on his car. We had to wait four or five months to get our money. And how can he come now and say this to us that he had the money all the time? But what has happened in Antigua and Barbuda, um, and I, I say this because it will let you know, I mean, Loftus, you and I have really been speaking for the last year. The, the ladies in your panel, they probably never heard my name before, or well, the third at least, and never been introduced to me before. But I grew up in the Antigua, but I was born in 1971. I grew up in, I was born in Antigua and Barbuda, grandfather, Father ran for 28 years, uncle ran for 28 years, went back for another five years. God rest his soul. But the situation is I left Antigua when I was 11 years old, went to the United States, have a degree in government and politics, then went to read law in the United Kingdom in two, 1994. And for love of my country, I came right back home after I studied law and read law and all of that stuff. I came back home in 2002. August of 2002, and my father was running again in the, in the 2004 election, which he lost. I was his campaign manager. And just bear me out a little bit here. And I remember I'm going down to North Street. That's where they have the Emancipation Hall. That's the union where the, the, the party meets up every yes, Friday, yes. the executive meetings and so on. And I was 11 year old boy when I left Antigua. No, I'm, I was 30 at the time of the about 20 years I went away. And one of the things now, it, let's take you to, they lost the election in March of 2004. And it's the end of 2004 or early 2005. They are building this car park and in the, on the green in the, in the heart of the St. John's. And the Labour Party wanted to pick it or march against it. They wanted to have protests against it. So we're there at the executive, I am there at the executive meeting. My father is there, my uncle Les is at the, the, the head table looking at me because I'm right in the front there. One or two other ministers are around. And what happened? The activists, the people who want to do something, the last election after 28 years, they want to do something now. They want to fight back against the UPP. And they're planning a protest. 
And then somebody said, but we don't even have a thousand dollars in our bank, the, the Labour Party bank account. And they went from the east side of the room and everybody's commenting what happened to all the money. And this is a true story. They went from the east side of the room and on the western side. I'm facing Lester Bird and one or two others and asked Michael is on my left side. He's at the front too. Go through all the comments. What happened? We, we know we had money or we're supposed to have something. Can not tell Labour Party in the office 28 years and don't have a thousand dollars to get placards and billboards and to get out the message? Went from the east side and they worked their way down to the west side. Before they reached the asset, Michael, for his turn to say what happened to the money, he does a preemptive strike. He gets up and he says, well, if you all are asking about the 8 million US dollars Labour Party money, um, I put the money in the US stock exchange and we lost the money in the, the 90, was it the, what was it the um, 1997 Asian, Asian little, uh, like a paper tiger um, bust? That is where he said, said at that point in time in the financial state of the world, he put 8 million US dollars of the Labour Party's money on the US stock exchange, invested it in bad stocks, and it got wiped out. <laughs> and that, that was his explanation. <laughs> so my head was down. I'm just listening. I'm just listening. And my head pop up. And I just come home. You know, I just come mm -hmm. home August 2002. And I, my head just pops up. Wait, Labour, I'm, I'm looking for $80,000, $100,000. When I hear 8 million US, my head pop up. I say, what? Labour Party had a lot of money. Where are I get the money from? So anyway, he made this statement before all the comrades down there that he put the money on the US stock exchange. The man at that point in time, Asset Michael, was not a representative. He was not a candidate. He was not a treasurer. He was not the chairman. He was not the general secretary. But he took the money and put it on the New York Stock Exchange and lost it. We have never seen a receipt. We have never seen any stocks to say, okay, these are the stocks you bought and they worth nothing. We've never seen any statement from his agent or broker to say, yes, um, we apologize. These were the stocks that you put it in. And unfortunately, they were, <laughs> your luck ran out. You went bust. Nothing. Lester Bird was there, I'm looking at him. He has nothing to say. So after the meeting, I'm still disturbed because what I'm hearing here doesn't make any sense. I asked my father, my, my father says, Bear Bird Jr. He said, yes, if you were to talk about really what happens in the Antigua Labor Party and, let, and the public knew what would happen, what's happening in that organization, there will be no Antigua Labor Party. I went around and asked several other comrades what really happened. They told me it wasn't the 2004 election that they made all this money. By that point in time, Papa Bird died in 1999. The Labour Party was not as popular in Antigua and Barbara, and people, the business people were not giving their money that easily to them because they consider them crooks. It's only by the, the grace that Papa Bird was around, they probably won the 1999 election. So what I learned from the comments who were around is that the offshore banking sector and the offshore gaming sector gave them a lot of money. Mr. Michael apparently was supposed to be one of the persons to go and collect the money. From there, all I'm going to say, because I do not want to be sued for defamation, he quote unquote lost the money. And that's the end of 8 million US dollars. Mr. But Mr. Bird, thank you. Thank you very much, brother, for, for, for giving us all that background information because it, it, it now really shows our listeners and viewers um, why the topic we chose to be, rich leaders versus the poor masses. And I want to thank you very much for crystallizing such points because it, it, it brings, especially the Antiguans listening to the program now, back some, some years so that they can better have a better appreciation for what they are going through today under the leadership of Mr. Mr. Brown. Brown. Yes. Yeah, let me, just, let me just tell our viewers, yes, we are live and we will be taking your comments and questions via the live social media platform. So those of you who are listening and looking on, if you have a comment or two, please feel free to post it there 
I'll try my very best as host to get your questions or comments to our guests and plan there this afternoon. But let me just now move across to Mr. Magic so that he too can chime in on the topic at hand this afternoon. Mr. Magic, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm right here. Well, you know what, let me just put this in context when it comes to, to, to the monies. The GDP of Dominica is 470 million US dollars. The GDP of Antigua and Barbuda is 1.4 billion US dollars. The average um, annual um, salary per capita for Dominica today is 7,250 US dollars. In Antigua, is 14,250 US dollars. Now, the Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt in housing allowance alone is 288,000 US dollars a year. The same for the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, 24,000 US dollars, if I'm getting the, the, the statistics from you guys correctly. Now, for Antigua and Barbuda, his, the housing allowance for the Prime Minister is 10,000 EC, mm -hmm. which is around roughly 4,000 US. But he has rented the house that he's being paid to live in for 20,000 US per month. So if you add the 20,000 plus the four, you get your 24,000 times 12 is $288,000 just for housing allowance alone. While the average, the average salary for a Dominican is 7,000 US dollars. How can the people of Dominica sit back and say that is okay there is no way and while we are talking about the, the leaders living this way or that we're living lavishly it is incumbent on the citizens where is the protest if, look i've called for the people in antigua and barbuda for ages to down tools just down tools because you cannot continue with an administration who is the so-called leader or the man who sits in the leadership chair, who before 2014 was struggling to keep a supermarket afloat. He begged the government of the day to put a, a, a statutory corporation in his, his mall that he had built uh, along with his supermarket because he was, he was broke. He took his son to the Board of Education to get a $5,000 scholarship. And by 2015, this man is saying that his son was a millionaire since he was 17 years of age. By 2016, his son has purchased property worth 4 million US dollars. By 2015, the man is claiming he, he bought a yacht. He's claiming he's worth 30 million dollars. But at the same time, we see contracts coming out with investors giving the investors everything. Investors aren't paying anything. Take, for instance, the Yeda deal. We have a Yeda deal that was signed by Gaston Brown. He signed a, a memorandum of understanding in 2013 before. Um, Mr. Hughes, I, I, are you there? Are you there with us? We are. Uh, we lost you prematurely. Yeah, I guess Before that's the election. Oh, okay. Economic. Okay, he's back. Yes. Hello. So now, fast forward to 
four, six years, seven years later, he now signs this deal with a millennium mm -hmm. um, special economic zone with this new company, Western Imperial Economic Zone, where they, they get everything free. They pay nothing to the country of Antigua and Barbuda. But coming out of that, one of the principles of that company now rents the prime minister's house, which he was living in, being paid 10,000 EC dollars a month. One of the principles coming out of that, that contract with the special economic zone, which was gazetted on the 23rd of September. We lost you again. Next. Twenty. All right, Mr. News, unfortunately, we have lost you again. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to move across to, I'm going to cross with a special egg. What's guys are taking on that stage? This, so that is this. Yeah, um, unfortunately, our, our internet in Antigua is not very good. Luckily for you guys, I'm in New York for the time being. All right. So, Mr. Brett, let, let, let me get back to you whilst, whilst at least maybe the internet service can um, get back. Yes, some... I just want to clear up one or two things that Magic was saying. That is correct. Yes. His son, the, the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda's son, went to get um, a scholarship from the Board of Education Antigua and Barbuda, a scholarship for those who financially have difficulties to, um, to study on the university level. I think it's, mm -hmm. he went to Monroe College. You understand? And the yes. problem I have with that is that you're mm -hmm. saying you're so broke that you can't afford an education on your, on your, your, your parents' earnings. So you have to get a scholarship, which they granted to you. But then when you have a, a mass in land, when your father gets into office, you become this billionaire and you, you're a millionaire and you are, you are uh, such a brilliant businessman, the father told us his son was. But on the document for the, the, the land, his address, the, 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 the multimillionaire um, son who is a, a businessman, the address for, for this, this millionaire is the address of Monroe College. This businessman didn't even have a physical business in Antigua and Barbuda. The document always say Monroe College. I will get the documents to prove what I'm saying. But the, the, the multi-millionaire businessman didn't have, a, didn't have a business, didn't have a physical place in Antigua where he, you could find him or contact him or do business with him. So he lists, I guess it's his dorm at Monroe College as the place to do business. So you, you just have to, to wonder what is going on in these people's minds and even more so the electorate to be putting up with this sort of abuse. You understand? And that is where we really are in Antigua and Barbuda. Um, I'm sorry about that. You're taking us for a ride. You're taking us for a ride to, to accept that your son was a, 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 such a brilliant businessman at 18 years old and he had all this money but he still went to get a scholarship for $5,000. Prime Minister never, never, never mentions that though. It's just always, they've always been wealthy. Just before, before I take a couple of comments here, I think that that clip we wanted to play to kind of get the conversation of the ground where this, this, this rental agreement between Pastor Brown and one name Mr. Singh is concerned. Let me see if I can pull that up where one Thank of you guys, Mr. Serpent, is making that announcement there, and we'll take it from there. Finger. 
in the parish of St. John, St. Mary, sorry, in the state of Antigua and Bob, you're hearing after call the rental premises for the terms. And now let me tell you something, big man. The, 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 the <laughs> resident, residential area that I'm speaking of here, mm -hmm. the residence, that's Gaston's house. That's Gaston's house. <laughs> Rented out to these people, Mr. Singh. Well, it says the university, but who's in charge of the university? Mr. Singh. Who is Mr. Singh? Western Imperial. Right? The tenant hereby agrees to rent the premises on terms and conditions herein stated for a period of, let me not get the period of the fire to figure out, just prove to you that we have documents in my hand. To pay the landlord for the rental of the premises. A monthly rent of 20,000 United States currency on or before the first day of each consecutive month during the rental term, provided that the prorated rent <sighs> 23rd September 2021 amounting to US $5,333.28 shall be payable to the tenant. By buying the tenant to the landlord, be with me, I don't have a spectacular closer. In addition, they have to pay a further sum of US $20,000 deposit on terms here in set out and in consideration for the due performance of the tenants and his obligations here after, blah, 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 blah. The tenant here agrees. To acknowledge that in the event that the tenant fails to pay the sum pursuant to clause one, the tenant shall be charged a late fee of US $1,000 for each day that Ooh. the rent remains unpaid. Right? Ooh. Let me tell you something. You are, you All right. Let, let, <laughs> let us take Mr. Serpent out there and let me thank him for making that clipping available to us here so that we can use here in terms of the information. Mr. Bird, any more information or additional information you want to furnish us with here? Read what Mr. Supert um, said in Antigua and Barbuda, something like that. No, well, that kind of broke when I left Antigua and Barbuda about this, um, the rent. Um, uh -huh. But just before I left, I think it was in November or thereabouts, we heard, you see, that that was not told to the public about this special economic zone. And it's not a special economic zone where you're taking up 50, 70, 100 acres. The special economic zone is on the western side of Antigua. It's 500 acres of, of, of land that's going to be part of this special economic zone. This is something which will affect nearly everybody in Antigua and Barbuda in some way, shape, or form. But we were not consulted. We were not informed. What happened is that the deal was already signed, the concessions were already given, and we were told about it after it was a done deal. So my thing is after it broke out and uh, after it was mentioned by Mr. Watt Serpent that the prime minister was the man's landlord um, for Western Imperial, he said that there's no conflict, I don't see any conflict of interest. Okay. But there has to be some conflict of interest because if, Mr. Western Imperial, I think it's a singer, some uh, Indian guy did Mr. not get Mr. all those cut. His name is uh, Victor Singh. He right. If, if Mr. Singh did not get all those concessions, all those sweetheart deals put into that agreement and no public scrutiny, if he didn't have that deal, would he have been renting a house to do business? And that is what the prime minister, anybody who really has the love of their country at heart and to be try to remain above the political fray. I am handling a multi-million, probably billion dollar deal here, which is affecting every man, woman, and child in Antigua and Barbuda. How does it look like the man that I am going to negotiate with to give or not to give a concession is my tenant? Because if that deal does not go through and he says, well, I want an extra 100 acres and I want, and you don't give it to him, will he go and rent? Does he need to, if he doesn't get what he wants, will he rent your house? 
for 20,000 US dollars a month? No. So there is a conflict of interest. So I, I don't know what is happening to the people in the Caribbean. It seems like if they, they, they're late to the dance, they're not understanding or they do understand, but they're getting some sort of scraps off the table. So they don't want to say anything to rock the boat. But any 12 year old child you explain this to would understand what you are saying, the concerns. You cannot be negotiating a deal with somebody to do a, a business in Antigua and Barbuda in that stage and be their landlord because it is dependent. If this man is a businessman, why would he take on 20,000 US dollars in rent if you rejected his offer or his deal? So, so can I can I say that maybe a situation of scratch my back, I scratch your back in, in that scenario? Boy, that's more than scratching your back, man. That's scratching your whole body. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. That's way more than scratching your back. <laughs> I understand. And that's more, and that's not even have... scratching. That's more massaging your back, massaging you all over. Because I, I um, went, who would want that? <laughs> fair comment, fair comment, fair comment. Let me see if I, I could have Mr. Magic chime in on the specific point that we're discussing, read his rent. I can Yes, I'm I'm right here. Look, here, here is the deal with, with, with Gaston Brown and the way he handles finances as, as a public figure. This is a man who said publicly that he told the, the people at APA to write a bounce check to West Indies Isle. This is a prime minister. He's saying, listen, I tell him to write a bounce check. He is, he is not afraid to tell you that, look, when it comes to financial matters, I don't hold very high standards. As a matter of fact, in the early, in the early 90s, while, while negotiating a deal with uh, Alan Stanford, it came out that Stanford paid himself, he paid Gaston Brown and Malvin Joseph hundreds of thousands of dollars for their constituency. I mean, and it was like, look, if, if I'll take the money. So the people of Antigua and Barbuda and the people of Dominica, we have to hold these politicians accountable no matter what the politician does he may feel it's okay he may sell it to the world that it's fine is there there's no conflict but we should determine that we have to get away from the partisan politics i read you this the statistics while you're pulling in seventy two hundred dollars seventy two fifty a year in average salary, the prime minister allowance alone, just his housing allowance, is 288,049 times you. Now you're paying this politician. Let me tell you what happened during the pandemic here. The, the administration came out and said, look, we don't have any money to buy vaccines. But the prime minister was able to give the country, country was prime minister was rich. How can the entity that is paying you be broke and you be rich? These things, I, I don't, these things happen in backward countries. We, we are supposed to be an educated society. Dominicans leave and go overseas to university, they come back. I, I listen to the remittances of $50 million a year. Antigua is $32 million a year. It means there's great interest in the people who live in what's happening in their country. So. Even if you live in the diaspora, you have to make your voice be heard. You have to come home even. Rather than send the $50 million 
take a trip back home. Find a way to come home and say, listen, let's motivate the people to do something about this because the monies that have been sent are obviously isn't being used to help and assist the welfare and the well-being of the people of the country. The people in Antigua and Barbuda are starving right now, today, as we speak. Women are, are telling you about prostituting themselves to make ends meet. And they're telling you this. You go on Facebook, you go on, you go, you, you listen to the conversations or you watch the posts. You hear what is happening. Why? The politicians, and let me tell you, all these in the administration who weren't begging ride before 2014, when they say begging ride, they didn't own a car, they didn't have a vehicle, some of them. Now they have mansions on the hill. Where they get the money from? When the, you know what have came out two weeks ago? The Prime Minister Antigua and Barbudi said that his colleagues are arguing that they need a raise in pay. Then, I mean, I mean it's laughable, but it's, it is serious. The, the, the former prime minister, his, his the housing allowance was $10,000 when he came into office. He said, no, that's too much. I'll take four for my housing allowance. 4,000 for his housing allowance. He thought that was good enough. This, this prime minister, as soon as he got into office, he said, no, it's 10,000. But who, who is supposed to deal with that? It is the people. And I'm saying to you here, those of you in Dominica, those who are listening, it is our responsibility as citizens and sovereign men and women of these two countries to determine whether or not it is okay for a prime minister to get 288,000 US dollars a year for housing while you're struggling. People are getting their utilities cut because they don't have any money to pay their utilities. And you are working for the people. You're lavishing in, in 288,000 US dollars. It, that, I mean, I, I don't know. For me, that don't make sense. I don't know. Uh, you guys can come, come in at this point in time. Just to make one quote from your, your, your tagline, which is rich leader, poor masses. Well, even Asset Michael, who is a member of the, the, um, the anti Labour Party, in his budget presentation last year, he said, you know what? What this administration is doing, they're feeding the greedy and starving the needy. And I think you can say the same in Dominica. Yeah, sure, sure we can say that, yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Magic, for your remarks here on, on the discussion. Before I go back to Marceline for her to chime in here, let me just take a couple comments from our viewers and listeners, because they too, they form part of the conversation here. Margo is saying here, they will never have enough, basically agreeing with the sentiments of both of our guests here. Marina Charles is saying here, those hungry hyenas, she called them. Shari Bryant is saying, same thing is going on with Skerritt and the cabal of ministers, they are all Grinch. Let me just see if I could get a few more here before we move on. Sandra Green, her comment here is, thank you, sir. We need to come home to help effect the change that we talk about. Um, Owen Prosper is writing here, hello, patriotic people. I'm not, as always, listening to the Supreme program. That is Owen Prosper comments here. Bernard Aline is saying here, Conflict of interest, yes, that is the point that Gabriel touched on a while ago. Bernard is, is touching on conflict of interest is the norm of the day in the Caribbean, Bernard is saying. And then once the deals are agreed upon, the leaders will do anything to ensure that they remain in power as they do, as they do not ever wish 
to be held accountable. Can I ask in Antigua, do you have, do you guys have an integrity in public legislation um, scenario? That is what Bernard is asking. In terms of any public, public integrity in public office, do you guys have that in Antigua and how effective is that before we go to Maslin? Either one of you guys could answer. Yes, we do have legislation. It was passed in the Borwood and Spencer administration when they took office in 2004. I believe that was the first term. It's an absolute piece of garbage. And what did you call it? it's rubbish. Wow, I mean, grown, grown men and women who said the 28 years of the Labour Party was so corrupt and so, so, so bad for Antigua and Barbuda went to pass, they call it the triumvirate legislation of, 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 of public order, public uh, life in public, public administration. So I can't remember what the term is, but when you see people want to sound like they're doing something, but don't know what they were doing, hadn't any clue what they were doing, and we suffer from the consequences now, because if the UPP was supposed to be the counterbalance of what the Labour Party did, then we have an integrity in public life act. And this is just a little bit of how the act is set up. The act is set up where the ministers or various offices in government, um, civil servants are supposed to go and let the, the integrity commission every year tell them how much money they earned. Yes. They tell the integrity commission how they earn, but the electorate who elects them does not know what figures they tell the, the integrity and public um, integrity commission how they, what they earn. So the, the head of the integrity commission has no tools, no teeth to if they see something way above what the person should be making or what is normal to do anything about it. Apparently what they do is they collect on a piece of paper, what these government officials tells them. And then that is how the public is fooled to think that something is being done to keep politicians in order. It was so poorly drafted, it was not thought out, but just the mere fact that you're passing legislation on a public servant, but the public servants' um, finances are too private for the public to know. When we are paying you, we are paying you this money. So how we can't know about it. If you're saying you have other businesses and so on, then it is up to you as an individual to determine if you want to throw your hat in the ring. But you can't tell me, oh, that's too private for me to know. Because I didn't tell you to go put throw your hat in the ring. You make that determination. You make the, the, you, the pros and the cons of being a public official and letting the public into your life and know in a glass, in a fishbowl, how much money you are actually making. That okay, hey, listen. Vera, Vera, and, and guys, may, may I just jump in here? Because while I, while I agree, I, I'm not here to doubt what Vera is saying, there are other aspects to the legislation. The thing is though, no matter how good or how bad your legislation is, is left to the people who are to administer that legislation. And let me tell you why I say this. The head of the, the um, that committee, which is the, um, what, what do you call it? The Commission, the, uh, that's on um, right here on High, High Street, just in front of Abib. Um, yeah, right, right. Maybe. But, but, the head of that, the head of that commission, we found out later when we saw the land deal for Gaston Brown Jr. was the lawyer for Gaston Brown Jr., the head of the Integrity Commission. So the, the head of the Integrity Commission has entered in a conflict of interest situation. So whether or not the, the legislation is good, 
which I would agree it, it needs to change, but there are other aspects of it that you can use. No, there How no, can no, you no, have? There, I disagree. There's absolutely no aspect of that. Okay, no. okay. So, tell okay, me one enough. thing in that legislation that we can okay, use to fight the, what's going on in The point is... One thing, magic. No, no, no. No, no. We don't, no, no. Okay, I, okay let's there. not... That's not, not the to argument. Can, to can, can decode what, what the UPP did. They no, 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 I'm it. not. No, 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 please. please. No, no. Please Vera. don't try to put put a ribbon around garbage. No, I'm not. I'm not. Yes, I'm saying to you. No, no, I'm not. So, so, no, no, I'm not. I'm saying, what I'm saying is this. I, I have not read it in its totality. And so I'm not going to disagree with you. What if, let's just say for argument's sake that that was great legislation. Do you agree that the head of that commission should not be an attorney for the prime minister's son? Do you agree? And don't, don't you? Are you asking? Don't you? I think this is the question that anybody can answer. Don't you think that that is a conflict of interest? That the head of the um, integrity commission would be an attorney for the prime minister's son in a land deal that is highly speculative that it was inappropriate. Listen, to begin with, the, the legislature because never, one of the never big ever allow things like that to happen. That were, they need to be safeguards built into that legislation to prevent that happen. But it was not fully thought out, and that is where I, I get a offended where you're trying to say there's something good in this legislation which there is not all right all right guys we, we don't really have to, to split hairs over that i'm interested both of you guys are saying the same thing it's just that you're looking at it from a different angle but in a nutshell the, the legislation we can all agree it, it needs some teeth like i will, I will give you an example how bad it is and uh, let me give you an example because i'm not just telling you what the legislation i'm talking about somebody i know about the inconsistency how did they how am i making that might be one of the reasons why okay um i have one that is not only talking about it as really yeah i got i got i don't know all right. Um, I'm not um, speaking um, about it um, as only um, reading the legislation. I am speaking about it as somebody that saw an inconsistency, went down to complain it to the Integrity Commission. What they used to do in the first year of this um, Integrity Commission, they used to um, print they, the only one time they did it. One year, I believe it was if it passed about 2007 and about 2008, 2009. They printed in the, the government gazette all the amount of money that the people said they made, but they also said who did not declare anything which they ought to do. A minister of government, Hilston Baptist, at the time never declared it, which by law he was supposed to do. I went down to the Integrity Commission and said, what you all are going to do about this? because there's a law that says they are supposed to declare it. I haven't heard back from them up to now. So and that was since over 10 years ago. So I cannot defend any legislation where even when you break the law, there's no teeth that they find him. He was sanctioned. He was threatened with a, um, a, um, a jail time. What's, what's the use we say we have integrity in public life legislation where there's nothing in there that will affect the politicians, there's nothing in there to say that even what Mr. Hughes was saying, the head of the commission was representing the son of the prime minister in land deals, which you found questionable went down there. He even said at the end of the day, Mr. Hill, that he can't do anything about it because the, the legislation doesn't have any teeth. He even yeah. said so, just, I think it was what? last year or two years ago when we were putting pressure on him i think that's 2019 he can't do nothing about it whatever happened just happened because it's it's more it is it, is we can't again it's powder puff it's something you put in your face and you, you look nice but you know yeah is that you're ugly you're ugly or you're good looking you know the powder puff can only go so far <laughs> 
All right, Mr. Bird, that, that was just a question or comment on the side from one of our from one of our listeners. Let us now get back to the substantive matter in terms of the, the house rent for both Mr. Gaston Brown of Antigua, that is your country, and ours as well in Dominica, that is Roosevelt Square. He's also renting a house, but it's on a sort of on a different angle than you guys in Antigua and Barbuda. I will give Marceline the floor now so that she can let you guys better understand some of the semantics that goes on into Roosevelt Skerrick rental arrangement in Dominica. Marceline. Thank you, Lofty. Well, I don't know if I can fully explain. Where you can add, we will help you. <laughs> the, the, the semantics of this guy, but uh, it's, uh, I know it's, uh, uh, the corruption and the machinery is well oiled. And uh, not only in Dominica, but in the rest of the Caribbean islands. Listening to these um, two gentlemen, it just, I'm sitting and I'm listening in awe and it just dawned on me that Antigua uh, and its uh, leadership is just as rotten as that of Dominica. And uh, uh, now, you know, it's like when you put in that, uh, aligning these two people and putting their criminalities vis-a-vis -vis and how they, 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 they um, break the laws and they don't care about the people and it's about their power and it's about their, their illegal maneuverings. These people are the same. And no wonder they both were embroiled or are embroiled in the in the Choksi scandal, and uh, uh, they are they operate like partners in crime. And as to why we the people accept that, why the Antiguan people accept that type of behavior from uh, from people we elect to do a job, I have no idea. But that $64,000 that was placed on the necks of Dominicans, the necks and backs of Dominicans, happened at a time when the country had been experiencing uh, the impact of COVID-19. Well, the second pandemic, because we have, uh, the country had, uh, had an, you know, well, have an 18-year, 18-year scary pandemic that integrated with this COVID-19 pandemic that started roughly, let's say two years ago. It was during the pandemic when economies all over the world was, um, was falling apart and economies are still um, I'm, I'm crumbling. Uh, Dominicans were on lockdown. Uh, they were not given a stimulus. How do you put people in lockdown? You have mothers with children to feed. You have uh, people to go to their jobs already. The wage is uh, so small. Uh, uh, it was uh, $4 and something uh, cents per hour. And we, they have just moved it to maybe $2 more. I, I don't know how much more they have moved it to. But the people could not get by on that. Skerritt has his salary, his governmental salary, whatever it is. Plus, he has a uh, plus uh, uh, his wife's salary, um, wife salary as uh, the, the the parliamentary representative for for Rosso, wherever Rosso Central, wherever, and all the perks and benefits that come under that umbrella of salary that comes under the income for their for for their home, they cannot live on that salary to the point that they have to take $64,000 monthly from the government's treasury in Dominica in the heart of a pandemic when the country is not producing anything. The private sector is not producing anything. The private sector is on shutdown. But he can do with $64,000 from the taxpayers' um, 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 money, the country's wealth. And the Dominicans who have no jobs who are working the $4 and five cents per hour beat, you're telling them you can do without a stimulus, but you need $64,000. And uh, the last time they were in parliament, parliament uh, from uh, my understanding was, is that 
another $10,000 allocated towards electricity bills and stuff like that. So in other words, how much are they? Is it $64,000 or $74,000 a month these people are getting? Those thieves in government at the helm of the country are getting while the masses in Dominica uh, as, as you know, just suffering, suffering, pilfering, hoping things are going to change. And with no end in sight of the poverty and the, and the mendicancy. And now, uh, now um, Magic um, um, said that, that sending uh, the, the $50 million uh, to, um, to Dominica and the people are not getting it. Then just, just, just hold your point one little bit on the, on the remittances that come home. You will get back to that. But I just need Paula here just to just continue on that track, on that track where the house or the parliamentary, the, the palatial building that Roosevelt's carried is renting. Paula. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Yes, Marcy. Yes. $64,000 a month in a time of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it's not only that. Like one of the gentlemen earlier, he spoke about stimulus for Antigua. And instead of their giving a package, the politicians in Antigua are asking for an increase. And we've seen the very same thing here in Dominica. The persons here in Dominica been asking for a stimulus package because a lot of the persons have lost their jobs. We've seen small businesses, some of them are still closed from since the start of the pandemic and nothing is being given to them. And the taxpayers of Dominica is paying $64,000 a month for a man to live in a mansion, he and his family, and where he owns a house in his community he came from. And like you rightly said, he doesn't want to be reminded of anything as a young boy growing up. What are we the people intended to do? We have seen most of the Caribbean leaders, they take the same route, they do the very same thing. And some of the people just continue to talk. And I'm saying, we as a nation, we have to stand against that. There are many persons who wake up in the morning, they does not have a meal. And you have a man, $64,000 here and his family. We as taxpayers, we continue to pay these large sums of money. And like you rightly said, there are other things that come with this. His wife, as a minister, the Rosal Central, there are other allowances that comes with this. What about the persons who doesn't have a job? What about the persons who've been struggling from since this pandemic? And we can see these leaders, they are corrupt and they are nothing more than thieves. Some persons may say, why would you want to call your leaders, your prime minister, whoever thieves? They are corrupt leaders and they are thieves because persons who are of good mind, loving persons, they are not going to do this kind of thing. And it continues time and time again. And we, the people, we definitely need to do something about this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Just, to, just as we kind of, you know, getting that point made a little clearer in the minds of the listeners and viewers as well, especially those persons from Antigua and Barbuda listening. What Maslin did not mention, what Paula did not mention. It is my duty to kind of, you know, remind us the, the, the nonsense, as I would say, that goes on into the rental of this property. Mr. Bird, Brother Magic, Roosevelt scary during a time of the pandemic as, as Maslin hinted earlier. His cabinet, has approved for $32,000 from the taxpayers of Dominica to go towards paying him a rent. Now here, here, when I said the nonsense earlier, here where the nonsense comes in, that it, it, it defies all logic. 
That same property that a lot of persons, they are of the opinion that it is Roosevelt's carried property at Mondanier. He said on the record, it is somebody's house that he's renting. And in any logical agreement, in any normal agreement where Tennessee is concerned in terms of house rent, you rent in somebody's property, the person would be obligated to pay their insurance for their house. In a sense, you're just a sojourner. You're just passing through your pilgrim, as it were. But Roosevelt went on to say that, hey, I, the person renting the house, I am responsible to pay another $32,000 for the house insurance per month. And my God, if that is not a level of criminality, I don't know what is. So that is how we ended up, Magic and Bird and the listening public, ended up as Dominicans paying pretty close to 70,000 EC during the time of the pandemic where everybody's struggling. And it, 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 it even gets worse. It even gets worse, whereby a lot of persons, a lot of struggling businesses during this time, they have not gotten a dime. But Roosevelt, just like Gaston, is making up with a lot of money. And we the people or the ordinary people are just there. Some of us are just prepared to talk. And we are saying this cannot continue to happen. Under pressure, under pressure from the public, Roosevelt Skerritt said, after the two years of renting that property, he will no longer be continuing the rent. That, that was after tremendous pressure by the public was made to bear. So imagine during a time of COVID, Skerritt said, a lot of people believe or, or, or think otherwise. During the COVID time, for the two years, Skerritt is, is allowing somebody else or maybe himself, it is alleged, to pick up $1.5 million and more over rent of a property, whereby the state of Dominica provides for housing accommodations for its prime ministers. But Skerritt and his gang would, would rather leave that place to rot up at um, Monroe's and not repair the place. That will cost the state, that will cost us much less. But he would rather put it in the pockets of a man, he says, by the name of Anthony Hayden, or some persons are even speculating that that money goes back into his pocket. I don't know. It is just an allegation for now. But, but, but those things are happening. In Dominica, it is certainly happening in Antigua. Some, on some other program, we'll be touching in St. Vincent's and Kids and Navis, you know, and the other countries to basically have a better grasp as to the kind of lavish lifestyles that so-called leaders, men who are in position, women who are in position, put themselves in and their people are, are, are left to suffer. And that cannot continue. We are, we are about to end about, we are supposed to end the discussion about six, but I know there's much more in the tank where Mr. Bird and uh, our guest is concerned. So I'll move across to Mr. Bird now just to see if he has anything else that he wants to add as we're moving on. I'll get to some comments after his comments. I just like Mr. to Bird. let the public know, as I said, to fill them in on what, what my experience has been with a party that I grew up in and a party that when I was born, 71, they were, Labour Party wasn't popular. You couldn't even get the leaders to, to get up on a platform in Antigua, you know, from the period of um, 71, 73, 74, because they're getting stoned off of the, off of the platform. They had to put the, the, the youth, the youth, um, the young people, so the, the, the people who stoned never actually had mercy on the youth. The leaders had to put the young people forward because they were so unpopular. PLM had run them out of town, right? And you come back, you, you, you think that this is an organization that has learned from its errors, an organization that had 28 years in there, and some way to be able to self-correct itself because it said it was a labor party. It's about poor people. Labor party was, a, was an organization that was founded by poor people to represent poor people's interests. Oh, you gonna come and tell me now you make it 20, 
thousand dollars a month. I don't understand the situation in Dominica because it's so similar. It's like the two of them knock one head. To me, it's like when they go to these regional head meetings, they sit down and they probably discuss, well, I probably can get another 5,000 if I try real hard, another 10,000 out to my, my citizens. I do it this way. Instead of taxing them, I get a quote-unquote investors to say you can, you can put up a special economic zone. I don't even tell my citizens about this economic zone, but the deal done sign, and hey, guess what? It just happened of all the properties I rent in Antigua and Barbie, 108 square miles. This investor just wanted my house. Mm -hmm. That can't happen. That is not normal. I say this a lot of times, and people may think that I am I'm, I'm ruining the legacy of my grandfather or speaking ill of Antigua and Barbuda society. Antigua and Barbuda and a lot of these islands were not ready for independence. We are not ready for independence because the sort of corruption that is there in these islands now, our systems of governments, our, our institutions cannot cope with it. There's no mechanism in our governments, the way we inherited them from the colonial masses and way it was set up that are able to fight the sort of kleptocracy, the sort of um, interest that the politicians have in making money over representing the citizens or the country. When I came home 2002, I'm going down there North Street and being a part of the whole thing. My grandfather never told me I had to be the next prime minister of Antigua and Barbuda. But he always told his grandchildren about the union and the party as much as you can. Never told me I had to be a candidate, never had told me I had to be a politician, never had to become the, the, the next um, um, second wave of Via Bird senior. But what I would say is that the mechanisms are not in place. What we got an independence to, to keep up with our own leaders using the same system to make them not rich, but wealthy beyond imaginations. There's no system in any of these islands that has been able to fight the sort of corruption that it's going down in these islands. Not corruption by any and everybody, but when the top is so corrupt, how do you, how, what does the system do to fight it? There's nothing there. I have always said that I believe that the, the, the best period of time that Antigua was at politically was in 1967. That was the highest period when the greatest achievement were done by my grandfather. In 1967, my grandfather met the, the owner of the sugar in, uh, estates in the United Kingdom. And on a handshake, he was able to purchase 85 to 90% of the lands of Antigua and Barbuda for the Antiguan people on a handshake. Mr. Moody Seward said, if you're able to get me 6 million, 6 million pounds sterling, I will send you all the sugar estates. And that wasn't a handshake back in the day when handshakes meant something. My yes. grandfather went the next day to the... Um, what bank was it now? Um, I can't remember. It was a um, Canadian bank. I think it's Bank of Nova Scotia or Royal uh, Bank of Canada. Royal, 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 Bank, Royal, Bank, Royal Bank of Canada. Royal Bank. Royal Bank of Canada. And let me tell you the difference between him and what Gaston Brown and Roosevelt Skerritt. What he was able to do was tell the manager to go and speak to the, the bosses in Canada let them know that it is Veer Bird and that I need a loan. And just based on his name alone, the next day he went into the meeting and said, you remember you made an offer in jest that you wanted to set 6 million, um, all the lands the syndicate owned for 6 million pounds sterling? Call the bank now. The money is there waiting on you. But those are people that had integrity and they weren't looking at it. <laughs> Boy, the way things go in both Dominica and Antigua today, they might have given them the loan and that loan might have gone lost and not been able to be found. But that shows you the difference in the type of leaders. And I say this to say, we, the Antiguan Zimbabwe, the people owned 85 to 90% of the lands of Antigua and Barbuda. They were the only country that actually purchased our lands 
back from the colonials. You weren't given to us. It wasn't only independence. Are we giving the, the, some of them are going to sell something? We purchased it all. Antigua in 1967 was land rich. People had lands. And those are some of the prettiest beaches. And you can, those are worth millions and billions of dollars today. But the only thing now, we have been dispossessed of those lands. We don't have any, any serious percentage of lands that are owned by the government for our, for our benefit. They keep giving them the way as to as investors and somebody's coming here and they're going to have Asian village. I know an Asian village, the project that was supposed to put in the Lester Bird regime failed. And now Gaston comes, he's not a very smart person. He, he, he um, refurbished the same garbage and they call it now the um, leader um, is a Chinese guy. He has supposed to be doing something. Up there, there's nothing. It was supposed to be put in, what, a billion dollars in, in 10 years into the economy, 200 200 million US dollars every year for 10 years. I don't even think we see $10,000 $10, from this man, but he has all the concessions in the world, all the concessions. I know Gaston Brown when I came back 2002, I didn't know him before that. I was only 11 years old. But one of the things they used to always tell me, he used to say at the meetings at North Street, I'm a businessman first and a politician second. Okay. Lester Bird heard it and used to complain about it. A lot of them complained. But what did they do? They saw the mentality of the man where he was going. He was going in there to make a buck. And they said and they did nothing. But when the time came, when the, the, the election gong bell rang, they all went to support Gaston Brown, no matter what, whatever he did, whatever the shortcomings he had, because it's the party politics where it's us versus UPP, and we have to get our people in there. It's better we in here than them. But I'm saying, what is the result for the, the poor masses? Because this man went in there saying he was a businessman first and a politician second. If he was the one in 1967 to go and purchase syndicate land for six million pounds sterling back in 67, I don't think that money would have showed up the next day for Mr. Stewart. But I believe Mr. Bow would have had a large chunk of Antigua and Barbuda land. He said he was a businessman first and all the governments got behind that, knowing that this man had his interest to represent people second to him making a profit. That is the reality. That's the sad circumstance that has happened in Antigua and Barbuda. That is the sad circumstances that has happened in Dominica and every other island in the Caribbean that our mechanisms on independence could not deal we have all the laws and the 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 the, the, the protocols that uh, civil servants are supposed to follow and they're supposed to do this and they're supposed to do that but when you have the leaders who are supposed to be putting legislation and regulations in place it is not done for them one of the advantages in the the the, the british have over our governments which we inherited from them say westminster system but they have conventions. And I'll give you an example, one of the biggest examples of a convention. The best example, and everybody knows about, is the Magna Carta. The King of England, King John, a ruthless guy, he was saying, my powers were given to me by God, and I don't have to answer to anybody. And the nobles were saying, well, if you're going to judge us, we want to be judged by our peers. Not that, uh, not back then, it, their peers were not even the common man. Anybody mm -hmm. off the street going in to judge them. Just, we want to be judged by a noble. It can't be the king just having his way and saying if we're right or wrong. Right? King John said, no, I am God. God's put me here to judge over you. They said, no. Well, let, let, let's, let's settle this on Ronnie Mead. Uh, some swampy lands where the nobles had amassed their army. And they said, well, if you are God's appointed or anointed, let us see that hole up, because we're going to kill you. King John had to relent. And that is one of the things where the whole idea of the jury came in that you're judged by your peers. They have conventions. And these conventions are things that are normal and normal practices now, but probably were bloody affairs in their system where those people fought for these rights. The conventions in Antigua and Barbie and most of these islands do not exist. 
because that is their history. King John and the nobles, we don't have those people. Or who is going to be willing to stand up to set the norm, the norm that these leaders must conform to some sort of public outcry when you hear a man making 60, we don't know if he made 60 or $70,000. Do you hear that? That man should, even, should be making at most four or $5,000 for his rent a month from a poor country like Antigua. How are you going to tell me you're going to make $20,000 a month or 50 something thousand dollars a month for? For what? Mm -hmm. What kind of house you intend to live in? And that is where the king is on his castle and the nobles back in the day. And it's not only that, that is just one example of the best one I, I believe that everybody could relate to. But we in all these Caribbean islands were given a constitution, but they have to be the conventions, the norms, the practices, what we expect. And these norms and practices, unfortunately, they are forged in blood on many occasions. People died so that these norms will stay or be put into place. Because the norm right now, people like to get on the radio stations, for nine days, they, they, they spit their venom how they're so pissed off for what is happening and they can't believe the government doing so that. And they go back to sleep, they go dormant. Who is willing to stand up to say, no, Roosevelt Skerritt, you cannot expect to get this sort of money because we are a poor country. And that sort of money can do a lot of good for a lot of people who are destitute who can't find themselves. Where's the stimulus? That alone could have been a stimulus package to some constituency, to some area that is really hard hitting Dominique. That alone is a stimulus package. What about the small people? Give them some of that, some of that, some of that monthly rent to keep their employees employed, assisting them to feed their families. It trickles down. The more people that are with small businesses that are kept open is the more likelihood that people will have their jobs. Even they may downsize a bit, take off a couple of workers here or there, they will still have their jobs and they will be paying their contributions and government will be able to roll over and you have revenues and you're able to carry out your functions of providing for people. But conventions are very, are things that are hard fought. And unless we, we get away from the, the idea that because we have a constitution, and the constitution say your freedoms and your rights and what you have to do as a citizen. And that is the end of it. That's not the end of it. You have to have conventions where it's not written, but the politicians know that's a no-go area. You do that and you're gonna have some serious problems. Serious, serious problems. That's all I thank wanted you. to add. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Good, for your intervention in that area. Um, by just saying that really conventions basically preempted a point that we must make before we leave here tonight. In terms of, after all that talk, after all that talking we um, doing here tonight, what do we do in terms of helping empower the people? That we will end up on in terms of the ending note. In terms of the leadership style, just before Mr. Magic come in, in terms of the leadership style of both Gaston Brown and Roosevelt Skerritt, I normally describe these two gentlemen as the same khaki material. I guess we all know what is khaki material, that, that brown material. But I normally go on to say that they are just a different shade of brown, but they are made out of the same khaki material. Because what is happening in Antigua, you can just copy and paste it and it is certainly happening in Dominica. Mr. Mr. Magic, your thoughts? You know, um, it's interesting that we brought up the Westminster system, because as we speak, this same Westminster system that we operate under has Boris Johnson fighting for his life, but Gaston Brown and Roosevelt Skerritt living like they can't be touched. Here, the, the thing is, the people of the region has to recognize the power they possess. And they need to stop playing, quote unquote, party politics. This, they need to stop saying, listen, 
If I support Roosevelt, if I support Gaston, he can do whatever he pleases. No, that is not how the system should be working. And I know why it works the way it works. It is because we have a failed educational system. We need, and this is probably at the topic of a, a, a next debate that is going to take maybe months, we really do need to re-educate our people. The, we, we are living, so to speak, or operating on the, an, an educational system that has been handed down to us that is geared towards a certain set of persons. This is why the system is the way it is. It is not geared for the masses. It was geared for the massa. So the system protected the massa, which the, the politicians have now taken the place of the massa. And the system protects them from the masses. That is the conversation we need to be having. Because the, when now these politicians have taken the place of the massa, they do this divide and rule, they, they, the house Negroes, so to speak, are those institutionalized ones, those ones who they will give a favor to, those who they will, they, they would give contracts to, they're dedicate, dedicated to them. So they're able to keep the system separated. And by keeping the system separated in such a manner that these, look, nobody with one ounce of common sense can tell you that what Roosevelt Skerritt and Gaston Brown is doing is absolute foolishness and doesn't help the people of Antigua and Barbuda and Dominica. They, they, once, you, once you read it, you listen to it, you hear it, you know it is foolishness. The question is yes, what are you going to do? And let me clarify something about the, the remittances. Yes, I know remittances come to, to individual persons, but guess what? What, the, what does it do for them? If the system doesn't help them, doesn't embrace what... Look, one of the things that people need to understand in these parts, because everything goes to the politician, it is not what you can do. It's who you are. So you may have the finances to do something. If the politician don't like you, it can't happen. They, they put stumbling blocks in your way every place. There are people here who can build without the DC approval, but there are others, they can build with DC approval and they change on you the next day or the next week, the next month, determine on how the politician wants to deal with you. It's a corrupt system. It is totally corrupt. And when you find so-called leaders like Gaston Brown and Roosevelt Skerritt, who will manipulate the system for their own good, it is always going to be a problem for the masses. Gaston Brown came into office stating clearly that he wants his um, political, his, his, um, his administration, his colleagues to enrich themselves. He added creatively, which makes absolutely no sense because if you're a public figure, once you enrich yourself as a public figure, a thief, your thief is corruption. You're taken from the people. It is as simple as that. Because if you represent the people and you enrich yourself, the only way for you to enrich yourself is from what is given to you for the people. Gaston Brown did, did not hide about enriching himself and his colleagues. Can I answer your question, Magic, on that point? I didn't get that. I was just asking you a question on that point you made. Did he... Did he literally say that um, his colleagues and himself basically came to office to enrich themselves? Is, am I hearing you clearly? Yeah, he told him, yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. that is a public I, I thing. I'm, not, I'm going to find you. I'm going to find the you the, the recording. I'm going to find you the recording and send it to you. 
and he has defended that position. He hasn't just stated that. He has defended that position. I, I don't know if you know a gentleman by the name of um, Maraj Makash, some guy, I think that's his name out of Trinidad, I think. He's a guy who, you know, he goes around the region and he talks about um, corruption in these states. And he stated clearly that what Gaston Brown is doing in Antigua and Barbuda is nothing to benefit the people of Antigua and Barbuda. As a matter of fact, he was on a program and Gaston Brown called in to the program and said, listen, I mean, look, you see the UPP um, politicians are now broke. What you want my my um my colleagues to do to leave office broke some of them I mean he he, he didn't hide it it's not he, he is bold faced about it and I'm saying and I'm gonna make a call for the youth of Antigua and Barbuda and the youth of Dominica to the youth of Dominica and the youth of Antigua and Barbuda this is your country we the elderly far a time gone we far a time gone. It is your place. This, Roosevelt, Skerritt, and Gaston Brown and their colleagues are taking what is yours, taking it for themselves and handing it to their friends and their cronies. It is time for you, the youth, to stand up. Stand up. Make your voices be heard. Make your actions be seen that you are not going to go along with these actions of these rogue, because that's what they are. They are rogue politicians. They are not here for the benefit of Antiguans and Barbudans and for Dominicans. Listen, Weber III talked about the loan that Antiguans got to buy the lands. No land in Antigua and Barbuda should be sold without a referendum by the people because the people bought it. The people paid for it. As a matter of fact, the people of Antigua and Barbuda and of Dominica, they slaved 400 years and then another hundred and something years of colonization. And the, these rogue, filthy politicians are now suggesting and stating and demanding that the lands that your forefathers, your ancestors slaved for, went through so much for, that they have the authority to give it away to persons whose forefathers themselves and who ancestors themselves did all those atrocities to your ancestors. It is criminal. It is, listen, those persons are supposed to be tried for treason. What they are doing is nothing short of treachery. Gaston Brown has stated categorically statement, quote, if it is that the Chinese are colonizing us with gifts, tell them come, bring more, close quote. A report came out of, of the UK just a couple of weeks ago. You know what they said? The Chinese have spent a billion pound in Antigua and Barbuda over the last couple of years. Where is that billion pound that the Chinese have bought? You know what they have done? The Chinese have now received five acres of land from Gaston Brown for one dollar. They're building a super lab, a super compound in Antigua and Barbuda. Not even their, their embassy. In, in the US is as huge as the one they're building in Antigua and Barbuda. The people of the region, not just Antigua and Barbuda, I'm very passionate about this, should, should come together to deal with all these rogue politicians because what happens in Dominica, what happens in Antigua, St. Kitts, Nevis, Anguilla, all those other places, it affects all of us. And all of us, look what is happening in Jamaica. It's affecting us mass migration of, of ja Jamaicans leaving Jamaica because of the foolishness that is happening in Jamaica. Most vast migration happening in Guyana for what is happening in Guyana. Guyana have gold, silver, diamond. They just found loads of oil 
in Guyana, yet Guyanese have to run away from Guyana. And we in Antigua and Barbuda have to absorb that. Why? You know why we absorb it? Because the politicians use these people who come here seeking refuge as political pawns to, to vote in their elections so they can keep them in office. And they set the, the, the sovereign people against the citizens of the country. So there's a war between them. All the sovereign Antiguans don't love you. We love you. No, it is not true. You're not loved. You're being used. The sovereign people loved you because if they did not love you, there would have been war in Antigua and Barbuda. And certainly, Dominica may not reach there yet, but I can bet you any money as you look around you, what you see, the number of persons from the different countries that are coming in. We have, what, 16,000 Jamaicans, what, 14,000 um, Guyanese, some what, 18 or so thousand San, people from Santo Domingo. We have endless Syrians, endless, the Chinese are moving in in drones. Soon from now, Gas, you know what Gaston Brown, he boasts that he has a country full of non-nationals. So he call them. He have a country that have more non-nationals than sovereign people, than Antiguans and Barbudans. When you start, to, when, when leaders, or so-called leaders start talking like that, you know you're down a slippery slope because if they're the only ones who are sovereign to the country, they manipulate everything. And it's all about the dollar. Let me just finish with this. That same house that Gaston Brown say he rent, to, to the guy um, from, from Western Imperial, he told the nation that he got a loan from an offshore bank. I can tell you today, that is an absolute lie. He never got no loan from, no, uh, from that, the specific offshore bank that he named uh, for the loan to build that house, which he said, incidentally, he took five years to build. Now, the house finished before 2021. If he took five years to, to, to build that house and he finished in 2020, he would have gotten the loan in 2015. In 2015, an offshore bank could not give money to nobody in Antigua unless you are a, a, a foreigner in Antigua and Barbuda. Okay? So Gaston Brown could not qualify to get a loan from an offshore bank. But that specific offshore bank, I know for a fact, he never got no loan from that, that bank. So here is the deal. Where did he get the money from? And he needs to tell the people where he's getting all this wealth from where he's getting all this wealth from the accountant general in antigua and barbuda left her post she run away couldn't take it anymore from the treasury that was not news in antigua and barbuda our accountant general could not take this administration anymore thank you guys for, for having me vent a little bit but it's what is happening in antigua and barbuda and dominica is it is really a travesty onto the, on the backs of the people, especially the young, who are looking to make something of themselves in the country of their birth. Thank you very much, my brother, for a very passionate contribution. I must say, I, I, I feel the passion and I feel the pain running through your veins at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Folks, it is already, it is already six o'clock. <laughs> Six. As I said, the conversation is very you know, interesting. Um, sometimes it gets heated as well. So we'll be less than trying to cut it off tonight at about seven o'clock. We'll be going an hour um, after our scheduled time. Just to, just to sum up on that point that we're making restatements, I was baffled. I was baffled. I was taken aback at your statement, Mr. Magic, Ree Gastons Brown, when he said that he and his colleagues, they basically came into government to get rich. Um, Veerbird is there, Veerbird basically backed you up, so I know that you're speaking the truth. Um, in Dominica- I sent it to Dominica, you, you got it? I sent you the clip. You sent me the clip? Yes, yeah, right there. Okay, well, I will try to play that clip. I'll, I'll try to play that yeah, clip. Yeah, sure, man. Can, can, can hear for themselves. But in Dominica as well, um, 
Roosevelt Scary thought that certain, you know, similar words in that there was once this conversation about, you know, he being filthy rich and stuff like that. And he said, you know, similar things like Gaston Brown in that um, I'm not quoting him verbatim now, but words to the effect that you guys will not send me back to Vekas, that is Vekas is his constituency, like my predecessor, that is Mr. Leblanc. Leblanc basically headed the Dominican Labour Party that's carrying our heads. And he basically retired very peacefully in his hometown of Vekas after giving up that post to um, Honorable Patrick Roland John. And this guy basically came into government with nothing. He did a lot for Dominica and he retired, you know, basically with nothing. A matter of fact, he could even go in his account and count how much money he had in his account, I'm, I'm being told, on, 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 on one hand. But Roosevelt Skerritt said, you guys are not going to send me back to Vickers like Mr. Libla, like you guys did to Mr. Libla, you know, kind of broke. So as we said before, and it is getting clearer, Gaston Brown and Roosevelt Skerritt, they are basically operating under the same kind of leadership style, very ruthless, very bold, very insulting. And I hope that our conversation ends here tonight by just giving the citizenry some kind of hope, some kind of inspiration, some kind of motivation as to what we can do to take up that kind of leadership style on our backs. Marceline, you have been there waiting for some time before Paula comes after you. Hmm. Well. You're taking a deep breath. <laughs> yeah. It is sad eh, that after a people have gone through slavery, the ancestors have made that type of sacrifice with their blood, their sweat, their tears. Then children of slaves whom we trusted are taking us right back to, to where our ancestors were, right into the, into the heart of slavery. And Mr. Bird spoke about the, um, the Chinese and Magic spoke about the Chinese coming in into Antigua and uh, Gaston Brown's embrace of the Chinese and, you know, leasing out the lands and, you know, it's the same thing that is happening in Dominica. We are indigenous Dominicans lands are being acquired by the government. Uh, the lands are being acquired and, this, and some of them, most of them have not been even compensated for those lands. But those lands are being taken away from them and they, the, the, their place, the, the people, the citizens, the indigenous owners of those lands are herded like sheep and placed in 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 um in um apartment complexes, shoddy apartment co complexes, poorly built by the Chinese, with leaking faucets, uh, leaking um pipes or sewage pipes. The people have been living in those type of housing condition with with uh, raw sewage on the on the floors, and they are being herded and placed, you know, on the side while the lands are being taken away to be given to Chinese and all the criminals whom have purchased our, uh, our passports through, they call it a CBI program, which is no CBI program. We know that's not a CBI program. Selling our passports, we have ordinary people peddling our passports. And when you bring in these people, that's where they're going to be on the prime lands, on the beach fronts, on the waterfronts. And what is happening to our people? They are being herded, herded on the side. And our people are accepting that. And you know, sometimes I wonder what is wrong with our people. Antigua, it's the same, it's happening in Antigua as well. 
But in Dominica, they're supposed to, uh, to be a, 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 a function in public accounts committee that can reign in the government, that can put some checks and balances to these people, but it is not functioning at all. And that's the reason uh, this, uh, the, the, the thieves in office can do what they're doing there because they can decide when they, to bring the report to a parliament and when not to bring it. And even if they bring it, there's no, no, no bites to it because we have a bunch of purchased ministers in the parliament, one of the largest parliaments in the Caribbean, 18 ministers, one man leader and 17 fools that just go along with the program, the eyes have it. How can you run a country like that with just the eyes have it when you elect people, when you elect people into office to represent their constituencies? How are these people representing their constituencies when they allow this one man rogue to just dictate and just go ahead and they just go ahead with it? Now, that is the type of leadership that we see in the Caribbean. It is fed by greed, corruption, and the appetite for political power. This is what the Caribbean has become, is the norm for our Caribbean leaders. And this is also tolerated by the old boys club known as CARICOM. And how, how did us CARICOM not have rules and, and regulation governing governing our rogue Caribbean leaders. Carib a CARICOM is supposed to be an international uh, governmental organization that was, that was formed in 1973 with the primary intention for policy dialogue, data collection and analysis, information exchange, development of legal instruments and dispute settlements, which they which they further the sectors of activity and states trade and mm. common markets, coordination of foreign policy, human and social development, security, taxation, and functional cooperation, whatever that is. Functional cooperation. How, how are these people, those leaders, sit at CARICOM and know that their fellow colleagues are a bunch of rogues and thieves impoverishing the people, no development in the in the in the in the in the in the country, the country of where they represent. No development of the people, breaking the laws, breaking the constitution, because apparently the constitution of the lands is is built, is, it was put in place to govern the people and not the politicians. So they don't abide by the rules they want to hold the people subjected to. And how can, how can this continue? How can this continue? And how can we continue to pacify ourselves with that level of corruption and just agree what is happening all over the world, all over the world, so we can pacify ourselves with blatant thievery of our lands the lavish waste of our resources and the skillful and well-calculated impover uh, impoverishment of, of our people. How can we pacify ourselves and just accept, well, okay, this is happening everywhere. It's not only in Dominica, this is happening. This is happening in Grenada, it's happening. So of course we can accept it. I believe for too long, we, the Dominican people, and we, the people in the Caribbean, have deluded ourselves that failures of leadership mm. will, in the fullness of time, resolve themselves because our history has taught, our history has given us the assurance in Christianity, believing that governments are chosen, are chosen by God, even when the process of elections or the process of, of those same elections is fraught with blatant stealing and, and which is glaring in our faces. Strangely, what have we become with the people? What have we become with the people of the Caribbean? We, we, we also, we the people, we also believe that partition, a partisanship is an acceptable substitute for citizenship. 
How can we love our party to the point where we hate our country? How can we love our party to the point that we know they are plundering our country? We know that they are driving our citizens down the path of, 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 of um, poverty, decadence, mendicancy, and we sit there and we do not say anything because we are getting some crumbs and the crumbs alone is, is, is satisfying to us because we love our prime minister because he has two dimples on his face. So we look at those trivial things. We love our prime minister because he's handsome, which I, I don't see it, but uh, he's handsome or oh, he's the youngest. What the, who does that? What normal thinking people with brains do that? When your children's future are down on the, on the, on, on, on the back burner, it is going down the drain. You, um, you have no hospitals, you have no functioning, you have no functioning institutions. All the institutions are broken because those institutions that are broken, have, they, they will have to be broken to facilitate that level of corruption. And you call yourselves a citizen. You call yourself patriotic. No, you are no patriot citizen. A patriotic citizen would stand up and demand better for their country would stand up and ensure that the laws of our country is first and foremost, that our sovereignty of our country should be protected. Our sovereignty is first and foremost, not the politicians because politicians come and go. What a people have is their country, the soil, the soil, the rivers, everything that, the, the, that, that you know the, everything that that add to the to um to the country to the land that is what the people have but when we sit back and allow them to destroy it and break take it away from us pollute our rivers sell our lands you know give our give our lands away like like it belonged to their to their grand, grandparents their foreparents when when we have a prime minister that doesn't even know his family tree. He doesn't even know where the hell he came from. Our Born Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah, that, that is a good note at least you end on. The next segment of this program, we will try to get into what can we do in terms of this discussion there tonight? How can we, through that very important discussion we have here, offer some kind of inspiration, some kind of a hope, some kind of motivation for our people because as a good book says, iron sharpeneth iron. And you never know. Something may just be said here tonight that will lift the spirit of an individual, a community that might draw them into some kind of positive action for country. But now we have a lot of persons there, Marceline, our guest, Paula. We have a lot of persons basically on the live feed. They are commenting. Some are for, some are against. The majority for, I must say, what is happening here. Let us just take a little time off now to include them, include their comments before I get back to Mr. Beardwick so that he can give us some more comments here as we're moving on. It is 25 past six o'clock. We, we, we want to make a wind down here at seven o'clock, so in the next 35 minutes. Let me just read Fifth Sunshine. This person is saying here, when I look at Skerritt, all I see is an evil written all over him that handsome, I wouldn't continue the rest. James Cam is saying here, thank you, Maslin, very passionate and factual. Elaine Vidal, she's saying, very important discussion. Pini Shirley, Shirley saying, the labor rights law, the prime minister, because he can give them money to bury the dead. Cecilia, bed minister as well, is saying, well, well done, Maslin Edwards, for your passionate contribution as well. Elizabeth Douglas is writing here. Well, I am pretty. Is that a qualification to be a leader of a country? That is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Douglas asking that all important questions. People are so shallow, no kind of critical thinking skills. John Alfred writes here, our, our people have become cults worshiping politicians. And yes, some persons may agree to that statement by John as well. Uh, Margot Margo is saying here as well, ha ha ha, I don't see, 
Um, and he had a son less in his brother, as alluded by Marceline earlier. So Marceline, uh, Margot is just agreeing with you there. One person for sure that is keeping our live feed very active tonight is a person that goes by the name of Hand Sanitizer. What a name during this COVID pandemic time to have on Facebook, yes. Hand Sanitizer. <laughs> Hand Sanitizer, his last comment here, or her last comment here, says, why you keep answering her? I don't know who is the her he's talking about, but I guess that is another person that is making some problem on the live poll. He's telling his one goes by the name of Rosetta White. David Joseph, a regular contributor to a program, he says here, Elizabeth Douglas, the sad reality is that the present children of slaves, our leaders, they say, are far worse than the previous white colonial masters. That is David Joseph's comment here. Let me just see if I could scroll on to get some more comments here. Viva Mamu, he is here with us tonight, or she's here with us tonight saying the PAC, meaning the Public Accounts Committee that Marcelin spoke about earlier, he's saying or she's saying it is designed so that it does not function as an effective watchdog. The laws, regulation, and rules must be amended for the PAC to be effective um, parliamentary oversight body. Let me just see if I could skip to some other fresh person's comment. Lix, Lixi, Lixi is saying a gang banger as to whatever that comment is about. Lixi, Lixi, we'll have to clarify that up sometimes later in the comments. Christopher, Christopher is saying, clearly the devil sent you to do his work, but you will be going right back to him. But well, I can see there's a little um, something, something happening on the live here. Um, let us see if we can take some more comments I engage or before we engage or re-engage as it will, Mr. Mr. Bird. Viva Ma Morgan is writing, Lofty Dura, Marcelin Edwards and Paula, hats off to you guys, great program. Only Q95 listeners are, list, are, are losers in this. Kudos to you guys. Um, let me just see if I could go to some more comments here. Norma Ito wrote their protests every day. I guess that is one of the one of the prescriptions that um, after listening to the discussion that Ito is prescribing. Someone goes by the name of Peter Zavi is writing here, no queens, kings, presidents, and those in high places last forever. Um, let me just take one more comment before I move on to Mr. Mr. Bird. It says here, Marshall, Marshall Lawrence is writing here, I believe it will be better whoever takes over governance by legal means. This will set a proper foundation to build on. Remember the goal is to create a more favorable environment. And folks, sorry, I cannot read all the comments here tonight, but we thank you. Didi Easter is writing here. What is happening in Antigua and Dominica is bordering criminal and these rogues passing as PM must be held accountable. These people are at risk of becoming good class citizens in their own country. So again, I want to apologize for those of your comments. We cannot read here tonight in the interest of time, but we want to thank you profusely, that is, for you being here with us, at least for the three hour, the scheduled three hour of this program, extended program tonight, very interesting program. Mr. Bird, you have been taking some, some relaxation in the background. It's, it's your time not to hit the road. Yes. Um... As you said, we want to keep it positive. We're, we're expressed for the last hour and a half, the negativities, the, the, the corruption, the, the bad leaders that the Caribbeans have at the present point in time. Um, the way forward, I believe one of the worst things that has happened to the Caribbean or to the world is probably one of the saviors also. This COVID pandemic has stripped a lot of these leaders, stripped the clothes off of them. The lies that they tell the people about how wealthy they're doing or how good they're doing, put, put the, rag the screws off of them. COVID is a bad thing, but it has some good effects. Because I believe where the masses, you told him in opposition, this man is not who he claims to be. His policies are not as good as he claims that they are. I mean, prior to 2020, 2020, the Antiguan people were told daily 
on the radio stations by the government that Antigua was the fastest growing economy in the Western Hemisphere, from Canada in the north to Chile in the south. It was Antigua and Barbara's economy that was the growing example for the whole entire Western Hemisphere, right? COVID stripped the clothes right off of these people because there was no stimulus package, even though smaller, not even um, economies as large as Antigua islands were given stimulus packages. Situation in Antigua and Barbuda is that COVID for one point in time, and this is the, the I don't know what, probably back in the seventies with the um, black power movement and so on, where the masses were listening to the, to leaders or people coming forward and they're, they're actually taking it in and acted upon it. I believe COVID, this, this era, where people are finding it so hard to make a living. There's so much um, abilities to, to inform yourself in social media. You're able to actually fight the propaganda that is put out by the incumbent. The Westminster system is designed, it's a very stable system. It's not like France or Italy, where they change governments and, and people cross the aisle so easily. It is designed for stability. And part of that is the advantage it gives these politicians. It's very hard to throw them out of office, but I do believe the masses, because of what they have experienced in the last two years, in the deprivations, in the lies, they were able to see through them. What I believe we have to do is not to look to your left or to your right, or look behind you up to look for leaders to lead the way forward. Each individual have got to take it upon themselves. And each individual has to realize that when you stand up against corruption like this, or against people in power, that you will pay a price. Hopefully not be the ultimate price, but you will pay a price. I have one who do not believe my leadership style is not to tell other people what I want them to do. I believe you have to go out there and do it yourself. At the time I saw how corrupt the Antigua Labour Party was, it's 10 years now, 2013, I walked away from that organization which my, brought my uncles, my father, my grandfather, my mother helped to build. I just walked away with it, walked away, left it alone. I do not intend to go back to that organization. I believe people need to seek third parties as a viable option. I do not believe in two party systems. Because whether it's the United States between the Democrats and the Republicans, or in the United Kingdom between the Conservatives and the, the, the Labour Party, or in Dominica or in Antigua, the two-party system is really designed to keep the masses satisfied so that these political class can, you know, I say monkey see monkey do. These organizations are copying the colonial masters, you know. They're dividing us against one, one another, dividing us to rule, divide us to conquer us, our will, our semblance of what is right is being warped by the way these, the, part, the political party system has operated. We need third parties in the Caribbean. We need people who are not looking left or right for, for leadership, but take up the mantle and run with it but it cannot happen so that you're looking at two parties to self-correct themselves for all the wrongs that they have done. They have gone so far, I think it's in Hamlet where he said, or Macbeth where he said he has gone so far to doing wrong that to turn back now to do right is just as difficult as it may be just to move forward with what he was doing wrong. He knows what he's doing is wrong, but it's so hard to turn back from that now. So I don't have any faith in the two-party system. I have lived in Antigua. I came back to um, from study in 2002, just over 20 years now. And for what I've seen in the 20 years living in my country, and as a son, grandson of V.C. Bird, the man gave me his own name. He wasn't my father. He gave me his name. Those two-party systems are no better than the colonial masters. They're dividing us. They are going to cause us to suffer the same hardships that our ancestors suffered through slavery and colonialism. In Antigua and Barbuda, we, had, we have lands that were purchased for the Antigua and Barbuda people. And the prime minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown says that he gets up in a willy-nilly now. 
I am giving the Chinese five, not leasing them for 100 years, 200 years, 10,000 years. He gave them five acres of our land for a dollar. And that is a good deal in his mind so that they can put down uh, an embassy in Antigua and Barbuda. So five acres of land in Antigua is China in Antigua and Barbuda forever and ever. Wow. How, is, how, how do you sit down and say, what did China do to Antigua to get this? What hmm. did they do for us? They gave us loans. They five gave acres. us loans. Pardon me? You said five acres. Five acres above Mar Mar on Marble Hill, just about going up from behind um, the refinery or uh, Western Israel, if you go up on the right hand side. I'm sure by, by this year now they'll be opening up the embassy. It's a huge complex. No mm -hmm. other country, no other country Antigua has given land to to put down the embassy. What did the Chinese do for Antigua and Barbuda? So because they built the, 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 the airport, it is a loan. They have built the hospital to some extent or other buildings, but it, they, are, they are loans. Yes, they have given us grants along the way, but they've given other countries in the Caribbean grants too. So it's not to say that they did something exceptional for us that you have to go and give them five acres of land for a dollar. But getting back to, to the issue, each individual has got to stand up and to create conventions in our own individual countries or our own individual societies of what the, the, the level of respect you're expecting from these politicians, where is the threshold, what they cannot, they, they can't go past this line. If it is not done, then these people in, in, in position of authority and power will just bulldoze over anything. We all come from Christian societies where you read, we all read our Bible and we all went to Sunday school and they teach you what is right and wrong. How can we all come out of the same Judeo-Christian background and we don't know a man saying that he tell, he advises other ministers to enrich themselves. Oh, but um, you enrich yourself creatively. By the time he said that, hundreds of people should have gone up to the prime minister's office and tell him to get the hell out of office. Indeed. That is not acceptable. It is not acceptable that you went in there to enrich yourself. You're not saying that you went in there to enrich your people, you know. Right now, today, Lee at work, um, uh, pilots and other um, staff members who have been terminated had such a vicious time losing their jobs during COVID. Uh, many of them are, don't know how they're paying their mortgage for their houses. Many of them who are pilots, they don't have the, the skills now because pilots have to continually practice flying, landing, whatever they do to get their skills. They haven't well, had any of that. So it's not like even they can go and get a job immediately. Pardon me? I heard of some severance pay was coming their way. That is the pilots and the workers of Liat. In what? what? In regards to Antigua? Yes, in regards to Antigua, yes. That is smoke and shadows again. Not to move off the topic. I, 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 mm -hmm. we, we could talk about that. But the situation the prime minister said, he's going to give you 50%. But the 50% of what he's giving of your, your, your severance or what you're, you're, you're entitled to is divided mm -hmm. between cash, land, where you don't know where the land coming from, and bonds. If you are having difficulty today that you're going to take 50% reduction in what you are entitled to, why are you going to take a bond which matures in 10, 15 years' time? Why are you going to take that and get in value property where you don't know where the property is now you could be putting it down by the cooks dumping you know? up you could be putting it by the, the dump heap you know you don't know what he's getting i've seen this man how he operates for since i came on 2002 and i advise my friends who are pilots to continue to aggravate and to to protest for what you are entitled to under the laws of Antigua and Barbuda. If you sign the way your other 50%, then what they're going to give is not even 50% of what you are entitled to. They're going to whittle it down. That man has a mental problem. He's not a well person. <laughs> He's not a well person. It is known in Antigua and Barbuda. Lots of his family members are crazy, right? His mother's a crazy person. Not to say anything wrong with, with mental illness but he is not a well person. I'm not saying that he's a psychopath, he's going out there like a, a homicidal, 
but the, he's not a well person. He doesn't think like normal people, right? And I think he has the charisma and he has the, 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 the character that draws people in and he fools people and he tells them what they want to hear. He even fooled off my uncle Lester, Lester Bird, the brilliant, bright, <laughs> butter skin Lester Bird. Lester Bird so stupid. You know, you know what Lester Bird <laughs> went and did? You know what the nonsense my uncle went and did? He went and signed a deal with Gaston Brown that, oh, they're going to give him his sofa and his maid, and he's going to have the maid for the morning, the AM, and the maid for the PM, and then you're going to sign a deal where you're going to get um, two years. When they win the election, you're going to get, Lester was supposed to get two years in office before he resigns and gives it over to Gaston. By the time Les Gaston gets in the power, he can look back on Lester. <laughs> you know, they all fall for his stupidity. And I don't understand what, what you're saying, Uncle Lester, what you're really saying, that after you serve for 40 years, go down to the convention, is either you win or you lose. He went mm -hmm. and he had an agreement. I don't know what he's going to do. If they breach the agreement, what are you going to do? Carry them to court to sue them for breach of contract? It's a piece of paper, Uncle Lester. How you get fooled into this sort of nonsense? It shows you if Uncle Lester can get fooled, he can fool anybody. My advice for the Antigua people is, is to stay away from people like that. I tell them like the Bible, I don't eat or drink amongst people like that. And I just hold them aside. Okay, you might go eat with them and you have the food good or the wine good and you start for 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 for, for not your, your guard you fall down and you, your next minute you, you're right back in with them. Hold your side and tell you and Bob, you know, it is wrong what he's doing to those Liat workers because COVID came, they lost their job. We heard about Liat was such an important for the integration of the Caribbean people. Oh, what is it now? If you can't even take care of the, the pilots, the young, skilled professionals, the what are you going to do to our average Antiguan poor person? If you can't even look about their interest, they have something to offer. They have a skill and you're not dealing with them. And what is going to do to the average person without skills? But I would say that each individual needs to stand up, whether you're in all the way from the north, from Bermuda, all the way down to Guyana. We need to stand up and stop looking over your shoulder, left or right. When I left the Antigua Labour Party, 99% of them said me crazy. So why are you leaving it? You on you fought the, 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 the government for 10 years. And on the verge of getting into office, I saw that they were so corrupt that I walked away and left it. And people thought I was crazy. But you know what? They're not saying so now. <laughs> Nobody said we are, we are crazy now. <laughs> I saw something was fundamental fundamentally wrong with the way that that organization was run, the way the leadership was thinking, because I was them. I never heard any plan to look about poor people. I was there up to 2003, the election was 2014. I was there up to the convention. And I never heard any plan from the leaders being amongst them that they're going to look about poor people or how, when they get back into office, what they're going to do to alleviate their hardships. What I heard from them was that we need to get back into power, you know, because um, things are kind of hard on them. <laughs> and they need to get back into office because they've been out for 10 years, right? I never heard anything about this man Nida. This man Nida was the one who was supposed to come special economic, economic zone on Guana Island. We never heard anything about these people because nobody was giving Labour Party any money because they're not trusted. Nobody wanted to be a businessman, didn't want to be associated with them. So they pick up this man from China, say he's a multi-billionaire and he's going to put $10 billion into thing. He gave Gaston money because even up to the, the you remember the, the election, you usually have elections in March in Antigua because it coincides with the end of the tourist season. After that, half the population is unemployed. So they, got, they went down to June. And the Labour Party and the UPP were trading blows. It was even, even, even. All of a sudden now, where you see one poster, one billboard by Labour Party, you see five. Man, some of the UPP man even start to tear up the poster and them. And the next day, instead of, if you see two posters tear up billboards, two tear the night before, you see five put in his place. And if you tee up the five posters, you see 10 put in this place. So the sort of money they had rolling towards the end, this man got a whole island. He was supposed to put 10, what, 200 
two two million two hundred million U.S. dollars into our economy every year for ten years. There's no hotel on the island right now. There's no restaurant on the island right now. There's absolutely nothing over there. But he got all the concessions. And that is why I'm saying to Antigua and Barbie, the people and people in Dominica, do not wait on the person on your left or right to fight for Dominica, to fight for Antigua, to fight for St. Lucia, for any of these islands. Because it's not going to happen like that. It's a situation like, like slavery. As my, my dear friend there, Miss Edwards said, you know, they say, well, there is corruption. It's, it's not only in, in Dominica, it's happening in Antigua, it's corrupt. I'm sure the, the colonial master said the same thing. You're all right off. It's not only in Antigua, they have slavery, you know, they have it in Dominica and they have it in, in St. Lucia. So don't worry about it. Just, just accept what, what you have. That sort of mentality is what they use against you to tell you, accept what you get. You can't do any better. You're accepting scraps off the table. We are human beings. Our ancestors survived slavery for two, three hundred years and colonialism. You are supposed to be the master of your country. You are not vermin, you're not a ratter. So why are you accepting scraps off the table from these people who can have rent in 50, 50, 60,000 dollars a month? When the LIAC workers don't know how they're gonna pay their mortgage, don't know how they're gonna send their children to school. That is not acceptable. It needs to come to an end. But I'm throwing people, don't wait on the leaders. You are the leader. That's sure. all I have to say on this issue. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bird. Let me move across to Magic for his closing comments. But just before I move across to Magic, let me just say um, one of the discussions that we must have, and, and, and I get that, I, I got that sentiment tonight by some of the comments that our guests made and even coming through the Facebook feed in that a conversation that we must have, and I don't know if you guys would want to join us here to discuss that, is the Chinese involvement, or I'm saying now, invasion in our region. I know for sure that the US, they are keeping a very close eye as to what is really going on, what is the aim, what is the objectives of the Chinese as a people in the Caribbean region, I think we need to explore that topic one day or you know, in, in a couple of discussions so that um, we can go a bit deeper into letting our people understand the, the, the danger that is down the road if we don't take stock of that problem. So I don't know if you guys want to commit now to be basically coming back sometime on an invitation by Civic Vibes to explore that all important question or situation. I have no problem with that. Anytime, man. Just give me a show. Sure. Okay. Mr. Magic, you have been waiting there for a little while. Your closing comments, sir, as to what can we do as a people as we bring that conversation to close this afternoon? Well, let me just give you just a, a little prelude to your conversation that will be coming up with the Chinese because coming out of the UK, it is strongly believed that it is the Chinese influence in Barbados why they moved to become a republic. And they have mentioned the one billion pound that was spent in Antigua and Barbuda, but that's just a sidebar. The people of Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica and the rest of the region must recognize that they hold the power of what happens in their countries in the palm of their hands. They have to stop listening to these so-called leaders, these corrupt officials, these people who are Oreo cookies, who have been taken by those persons who have, who have basically miseducated them and handed them this false sense of you are the boss of your people. And they put in what the, the slave, the, I, I, I hate to say slave master, because master is a good thing. Those criminals, what they did to our forefathers, that's exactly what they did. of the region today. 
Now they have this. In the age of these local leaders, they get on the media platform, social media and radio TV, almost on a weekly basis and spew lies after lies after lies to the people of the region. And one of the things that the people tend to do is, no, our leader would not do that. Well, let me tell you all something. Yes, they will do that. And they have done that. And they collaborate. And I prove that they collaborate. In spite of all that Gaston Brown has done and said to the people of Antigua and Barbuda, as the outgoing chair of CARICOM, he was given a, let me tell you, they, they spoke about him so glowingly, like he did such a great and fantastic job. While the people of Antigua and Barbuda you know that Gaston Brown is nothing but a fraud. That's what he is. He's a charlatan. Everything that he said that he is, he is not. And there, every statistics are there to prove it. Everything. If you go through from 2014 to today, you cannot find one positive that Gaston Brown has done for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. Not one. But you can see that his colleagues have been enriched. He has been enriched. Look, we have documents to show that Gaston Brown transferred $4.32 million worth of land to his son's mother for $79,000 worth of land. 79 to 4.3 million. That was a trans, that was a switch. That was that was what he called a trade. And the people of Antigua and Barbuda cannot buy that and should not buy that. To the people of Dominica, to the people of Antigua and Barbuda, who we sit here, and we have documents to show. We have documents, the documents are there to show. Listen. I am not here to spew no lies. I will send you, I will get the documents and send them to you. Okay? He, he, they, they, they transfer lands from down um, George Bay to lands right next to the same embassy. Even though 12 acres of land, they claim to be worth $600,000. The banker who has so lands in those areas and no, an acre land in that area is $360,000. That's the word. Mm -hmm. So 12 acres. So this is not no made up stuff. Here is the thing. Here's the thing, people of Antigua and Barbuda and Dominica, who we represent right now, and by extension, those in the region. You have the power. You, the people. You need to put aside party. The country is more important than the party. If we allow these rogues to continue, you are going to be homeless. You are going to be a people with, well, you can't be a people without a land because if you don't have a land, you're not a people. The nomads were considered nobody because they're not in a place. We are going to be, we are going to have the Syrians, the Chinese, and everybody outside who has some type of money. You don't know where you get it, they get it from. And let me tell you this Gaston Brown is implicated in the biggest international scandal on planet earth the Odebrecht scandal he's named in the spanish newspaper for taking bribes he have never he has he has never sued that that newspaper la paz in spain he's named y'all don't have to be scared i can i'll send all y'all send you the links they have manipulated the media to go along with their lies 
and their falsehoods. And while they're doing that, they're taking monies and they cannot account for those monies. They're building buildings all across the country. They're buying up all kinds of places and the people have nothing. People, it is your time. It is your time to resist. It is time. Look, if you continue to follow these rules, you're going to be nothing. You have to get up, rise up against these people, revolt. The people must revolt because these rogue politicians, they have the judiciary in the palm of their hands. Gaston Brown is on record the director of public prosecution in Antigua and Barbuda take money from a member of his cabinet in order not to go to prison. This is what is happening. People are out there threatening citizens of Antigua and Barbuda and the commissioner of police does nothing. You know why? Gaston Brown is on record of saying whoever he appoints does what he says, not what the people needs them to do. He says the governor general cannot call an inquiry under his watch. Now, when Gaston Brown can tell the governor general who is supposed to be, now I don't give I don't give two hoots about no queen. However, that is a system that we fall under. When Gaston Brown can say the governor general cannot call a commission of inquiry, which he has all authority to do. And the governor general written to by the leader of the opposition to call a, an inquiry into the Odebrecht scandal. And he does nothing. It says that Gaston Brown is in control of the actions of the governor general. The director of public prosecution, as a matter of fact, as a Michael, as an MP, says, and I quote, I have irrefutable evidence that the chief magistrate is corrupt. You know what happened? Nothing. People, you are at the whim and fancy of rogues. And if you allow yourself to stay in that place, you are going to be destroyed. In order to survive, you yes. must revolt. You must stand up. You must go out. You got to protest. You got to march. You got to down tools and say, enough is too much. People of Antigua and Barbuda and Dominica, thank you guys so very much. All right, my brother, thank you very much for your very, as I said before, passionate contribution. And for sure, you promised to send some of those documents to me, so I'm waiting. Certainly, for certainly, without doubt, without I doubt. To, I want to thank you for your contribution here tonight. In terms of just going around the table for closing comments, let me move across to Maslin Edwards for her closing comments as we bring this program to a wrap in just a bit. Maslin. Thank you, Lofty. Well, what I have to say is this. It, is, it seems that the Caribbean is ripe for a revolution because we have rogues planted in all the offices in the Caribbean. Gone are the days when we had noble leaders representing the Caribbean. We don't have that anymore. We have a bunch of rogues who are in office for themselves. And we, the people, have accepted our own apathy and tolerated what has become a frontal assault by our, the people we elect into office. 
it is time we stand up as a people and look into our own welfare. It's time we stand up as a people and demand the better because the better we are not going to get better by just sitting and relaxing and waiting for things to fall in our lap. We do not have a democratic governments in the Caribbean anymore. What we see in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean islands, are quasi dictatorships. People who went in poor, ask for your vote, ask for your support, ask for your trust. And as soon as you trusted them with that vote, what did they do? They turned it against us. They now have become our bosses. They now have become our colonial masters, the new colonial masters. And how long are we going to tolerate that as a people? We have to stand up. We have to make those sacrifices. We have to create the Caribbean spring where we go out in the streets and we stand up for what we will never get from our law books, what we will never get from the constitution because these corrupt men in office have broken the constitution and used the constitution against the people. We cannot get these people out through democratic means. We will mm. have to get them out by any means, any means necessary. This is why we have to stand up for electoral reform because all of the discussion is coming on, especially for Dominica is coming due to the fact we have no reform. Until we get electoral reform, we will be able to, to elect people into office who will work for, for the interests of the Dominican people, who will work for country. We can no longer continue to have those toxic, poisonous, black oil soaked leeches in, in the offices of our countries. Because what do they do? They destroy our countries. They create uh, uh, an albatross um, around the neck of our people and our country, our democracy is in, is in, is in, is in trouble. We have very Thank incompetent you. leaders. Thank you are, very much for your closing comments. Thank you very, very much. Yes, Loftus. And, and thank you. One more thing I have to say. Thank yeah. you for all the people who have logged in onto this uh, Civic Lives uh, Vibes platform. We could not have done it without you. For the past two weeks, you all have been there. I thank you very, very much. I thank our guest tonight for being here with us and for enlightening us as to what goes on in Antigua that is similar to what goes on in Dominica. So thank you everyone and God bless us thank as you. a people. Thank you very much, Marcel, for your closing comments. Let me move across to Paula here with her closing comments as we bring the conversation to wrap in just a bit. Paula. Yeah, thank you, Lofi. I want to say thank you to our guests. Thank you, Marceline, as well. And Marceline, you took the word from me. A revolution is needed in Dominica and in the other Caribbean countries that has these corrupt and criminal leaders. We've seen in a pandemic that the World Bank have given some finance to our government of Dominica. And instead of giving a stimulus package to the people, actually this money was put at the aid bank and the government say, you can go there and get a loan. Mm. So I want to say a revolution is definitely needed in the Caribbean countries and we all need that at the same time. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much Paula for your closing comments. Let me just wrap up things here. First and foremost, let me thank our two formidable guests. I, I think they did a very, very um, good job tonight, an excellent job tonight in terms of presenting here tonight. Mr. Ian Hughes, thank you very much, brother. Also, Mr. Via Bradford, thank you very much for letting the listening public, those of us in Dominica and for Garfield, get a much better understanding of why Laston Brown is so rich and his people um, in Antigua and Barbuda, they are so poor. Thanks very much as well, Marceline Edwards and Paula Celestine for basically crystallizing the point where Dominica is concerned, um, where Roosevelt Scary is so rich and the Dominican people by and large is they are so poor. So thank you folks, thank you very much for your time. Most of all, 
the people who are on the live stream, the persons who checked in, you basically made the program happen. You made it worthwhile. So we at the Civil Vibes team, those of us you see seen on this player, those who are in the engineering room as it were, um, we want to thank you very much. Same time, same place next week Sunday for, Mary, for another rather interesting topic of discussion. We will be here next week Sunday. So we want to thank you very much. And please, Mr. Gabriel Fred and Mr. Magic, thank you very much, guys, for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me Good on morning. the show. Thank um, you so very much. Right. Always an honor. Always an honor. Thank you. All right. So we, we, we will hook up sometimes in a subsequent program where at least we may want to discuss the Chinese involvement or invasion, I call it, in our Caribbean basin. Definitely. Ladies, take good care. Thank you so much uh, for Thank the you. conversation that we had. Loftus, we'll talk again real soon, right? Thank you, brother. Yes, we can do Thank you, guys. The, the, the honor is mine. Thank you guys so very much. To all the people who, who listen live and to the, the beautiful ladies in studio, thank you so very much as well. Have a good one. Thank you. Yes, lovely. Before we end, I want to say one thing. These criminal leaders that we have, that pass the countries as leaders, they govern the country, they do not do this all by themselves. They do this with the help of the ministers that they have with them. Because if the ministers that they have with them say, I'm not for this, these leaders definitely will not get their way in. So these corrupt leaders, they do this with the help of their ministers. Thank you, Lofi. Right, can, you can I say one thing, please, before we end? No problem, Marceline. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Lofty. I just want to do a little advertisement for Shirley Allen. It's, uh, this is Shirley's um, creation. This is her invention. It is um, Shirley's Delight. It's a uh, coffee in, a, in the tea bag form. I just got my order today. It smells very good. Uh, so I would like you guys to place your orders. It's Shirley Allen. That's her business. And let me see if I can give a little breakdown of the gummy. It's a gummy coffee. It's, um, it says coffee with a zing. Shows delicious coffee with all natural health benefits. A healthy choice for coffee lovers uh, on the go. Easy brew, three steps away to a delicious cup of coffee. So you just put it in your tea bag form and it is right there. And she also has uh, some great, um, great um, jewelry. She also makes jewelry as well. This is a piece I wanted to wear, but it wasn't matching my attire. So that's why I did not wear it this afternoon. But you all can place the order. Excuse me? So, so the, all that is from, all that is from shows. Yes, so I will be wearing her piece the next time uh, with the right outfit. Martin, I want to contact for Shirley for this um for this necklace. Yeah, <laughs> uh, this one. Oh, I, I gave it the twist uh, because uh, I, I like things a little extraordinary. So I gave it the twist. It's, it looks better with the twist. And you put it on and it's all beautiful. And she has the earrings and everything. Let me see if I have a contact Shirley, number here. Shirley, Shirley, well, Shirley, well, she's on Facebook. Shirley, Excuse she's me? In she's in the literary arts. She's in jewelry now. She's in coffee product. She's in coffee business. What is Shirley not involved in? Because you know what? She's an Aquarian woman. We need to get Shirley on. We need to get Shirley on something. Very creative. Yes. So, um, so Shirley is on Facebook. Shirley Allen is called Shirley's uh, Gourmet Coffee. Shirley's. That's her, that's her business, her brand name. Right. And this smells so good. Look at this. I can't wait for me to get up in the morning and brew brew my first cup from it. it smells good from, from the bag. Properly packaged. Oh yes, yes, very properly packaged. I think the um, the labels were made. The labels were made by um by um. Uh, let me find the right word. Um, now you see art gallery. That's um Dr. Dale um Dangleben, Serge Resnet on Facebook. So the labels were made there. I also have, you know, the nice printed cup as well, uh, you know, for the coffee, but 
I, I forgot my cup of coffee out there <laughs> earlier. So I left it on the table. But there's, you know, but it's all all packaged. It's all nicely packaged and very attractive and a nice easy sell. I, and so go support a, a local Dominican. That's a that's that's good business. Go support it's our own. It's uh, it's um, natural and it's you know creative and it's everything. It's everything natural. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, okay, Master. Thank, thank you very much, Paula. We'll just give our listeners the music as they make their way out of this program. Again, we want to thank all our viewers, all our listeners. That is where it is happening now, folks. The Civic Vibes program. Please spread the word. It is growing in lips and bones. And we we are we 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 cannot say we are not having a very good time here each and every Sunday from the four hour. Thank you very much. We may, we may have something come February for you in terms of an added program, but Marceline will lead on that discussion maybe next week Sunday. All right. So please stay tuned. Yes. Uh -huh. Call our things here on the Civic Vibes program. Thank you. Thank you very much, people. Yes. Mm -hmm.